It was December 23, 1987. Twenty-year-old Janet Brachu was enjoying an evening out with friends when her night was cut short. While everyone else was allowed into the T. Woody's bar, Janet was just shy of the legal drinking age. She was asked to leave. A man she had met earlier that evening offered to drive her home. She then got sick in the parking lot and he refused to allow her into his car. Exactly what happened next to Janet was a mystery for over three decades before the person who took her life that brisk December evening was finally revealed. And shockingly, it was not only Janet's demise he was responsible for. Janet Brachu grew up in Winslow, a small main town situated along the Kennebec River. Back in the 1980s, Winslow had a modest population of around 8,000 residents. It was a quiet town and a good place to raise children. Janet's parents, Geraldine and Albert Brachu, adopted her as a young child and raised her into a bright, happy young adult while helping her to manage her diabetes. She needed regular insulin, but Janet was responsible when it came to the important things. Her early dealings with her own medical care may have even been what inspired her to get into the field. As of late 1987, she was working as a dietary assistant at Maine General Medical Center's Seton campus. But on that December evening, work was the last thing on Janet's mind. It was their holiday break from college and the perfect time to be catching up with old friends from high school. Janet did not often get to see them. Their first stop was a local bowling alley in the town of Waterville, less than a mile away from Winslow. While the friends took their turn sending the ball down the lane, they struck up a conversation with two men in the next alley over. They got on well enough to want to continue the evening together. And once everyone was finished, they set off to T. Woody's restaurant and bar. The bar was found on the lower level of Waterville's concourse with a great view of the river. When they arrived, Janet was turned away. Maine's drinking age had been raised to 21 only two years prior. Janet now just missed the mark. Her friends were all of legal age and they wanted to keep the night going. Janet, being the odd one out, needed to find a ride home, and it just so happened that one of the men they had met at the bowling alley was happy to oblige. The details of what followed are loose, but there are a few facts we do know. Janet had forgotten her purse inside T. Woody's, and the man who was supposed to be driving her home went back inside to retrieve it, possibly because Janet was not allowed back in. When he returned to the parking lot, Janet was throwing up. It could either be because she had been drinking earlier in the night or from some other reason, like her diabetes. She could also have possibly eaten something that did not agree with her. The man who was supposed to take her home then refused to allow her into his car, not wanting her to be sick inside it. Then she was gone. Janet's parents woke up the next morning to find she was not home. After calling around to see if she had stayed at any of her friends' houses and having no luck tracking her down, Geraldine and Albert reported her missing. An extensive search was launched and Janet's disappearance appeared on news stations across the country. The investigators tasked with finding out what happened to Janet turned over every stone. They followed up on each lead presented to them, no matter where in the country it came from. They even tried to use the fact that Janet was diabetic to find her. They looked into insulin sales that could possibly be tied to Janet. Unfortunately, no matter what they tried, they never seemed to get past square one. And soon the days turned into weeks, and still Janet was nowhere to be seen. It truly was as if she had vanished into thin air. Janet's family tried to hold on to the hope that she would be brought home alive. Each agonizing day since her disappearance, they prayed a call would come through from the police department with good news. Those hopes were crushed less than three months later. 
A call finally came, but it was the one no parent ever wants to receive. In the early morning hours of March 18, 1988, a man called Christopher Anthony was checking on his hydropower station at Waverly Avenue Dam. He then made a terrible discovery. Floating in the Sebastocook River was an unclothed body. Christopher notified the authorities who were soon on the scene. That section of the river was cordoned off. A cursory search was conducted along the river's edge to see if any items of interest had been left behind. The body was taken to the coroner's office to be examined and identified. There, they discovered it belonged to Janet Brachu. The initial examination did not reveal what had caused Janet's passing. It was, however, determined that Janet had not been alive for long after she was last seen at T. Woody's. In the weeks following the discovery, a specialized dive team was set up on the Sebastocook River. They were trying to find any of Janet's personal items or evidence that could point to what happened to her in the hours after she was last seen. The investigators could not yet rule out the possibility that Janet had fallen in the river herself that night. The Kennebec and the Sebastocook rivers meet not too far down from T. Woody's. It was cold and dark when she was left in the parking lot. Maybe Janet tried to walk home and accidentally slipped into the frigid waters while crossing the bridge leading back to Winslow, unable to get herself out before succumbing to hypothermia. But there was one serious problem with this theory, the lack of clothes on her body when she was found. It was highly unlikely that the water's current could have stripped Janet entirely of everything she had on that night. And even more importantly, Janet's body was found upstream of the river. This meant it would not have been possible for her to have fallen in while walking home and ending up where she was found. But if Janet did not fall into the river, who had put her there? As the mystery continued, folks in Maine began wondering whether a serial perpetrator was on the loose. It was an avenue the investigators had begun looking into as well. An hour away in the town of Jay in Maine, 17-year-old Kimberly Moreau vanished on May 9, 1986. She was last seen with someone she had met earlier that same day. Despite a diligent search across the state, the police were unable to find out what had happened to her. No connection could be drawn from Kimberly to Janet's case. Unbeknownst to the investigators, another woman would go missing just five months after Janet's body was found. And her case had far more similarities to that of Janet's. On August 9, 1988, 23-year-old Geraldine Finn was letting her hair down after work with two co-workers. She was employed at the Scohegan Nursing Home as a certified nursing assistant. The bar, called Pete and Larry's, was in Waterville's Upper Main Street. It just so happened to be no more than three miles from T. Woody's, where Janet was last seen. While Geraldine and her co-workers were sitting by the window, a stranger drove past in his blue Chevy Blazer. He caught their attention and began gesturing for the three young women to go outside. They did just that and began walking to his car. He then asked if they wanted to go for a swim. However, this was not exactly an innocent request. By the time they were at his rolled-down window, the women found he was completely nude. He requested that they go skinny dipping with him. Likely weirded out by the interaction, they turned around and went back to the bar to continue their evening. It was not even 8.30 p.m. yet, and the group still wanted to spend some time out before heading home. Some time went by before that same man arrived at the bar, this time fully clothed. As the evening progressed, he started to speak to Geraldine's group. Maybe he offered up some sort of excuse for the earlier interaction. He was possibly blaming it on the fact that he had already been out skinny dipping and his clothes were wet. Whatever he said, 
it was enough for Geraldine's group to start interacting with him. By the end of the night, Geraldine felt comfortable around the man, so much so that she accepted his offer for a ride home. The last time those friends saw Geraldine, she was sitting in the passenger seat of his Chevy. Little did they know they would never see their friend alive again. She was reported missing the following day. Her friends told the authorities about the man who was supposed to take her home that previous evening. They mentioned his blue Chevy blazer, distinctive mustache, and diamond-shaped tattoo on his shoulder. On August 14, 1988, five days after Geraldine went missing, a man walking across the property along Route 201 made a terrible discovery. In a wooded area along the field he had been surveying was the body of a young woman. Initially, the authorities remained tight-lipped about the nature of what they were investigating. However, two days later, they announced that it was the body of Geraldine Finn. They noticed it was not an accidental fatality. Someone took her life. Now, the main focus was on finding the man she had last been seen with. Soon enough, they would find out who he was. A 29-year-old man named Gerald Goodale. Gerald Goodale worked various construction jobs in Waterville. When his name was brought up in relation to Geraldine Finn's case, those who knew him personally seemed to act surprised at the news. A family friend said Goodale had always been helpful, happy to jump in where he could to assist in any way possible. Goodale's father also reacted to the news, saying that nothing was adding up. His son could not have done anything to hurt Geraldine. He claimed his son had an alibi for that night. Goodale's father said that he had been at home until 9.15, waiting for a phone call. After that, he went out mud running. Obviously, the investigators took what his father was saying with a pinch of salt. They were not going to take a family member's word for it. Especially not when the co-workers who were with Geraldine that night said Goodale looked just like the man who was last seen with her. After placing Goodale under police surveillance, the authorities moved to arrest him on August 15th. He was taken into custody and charged with taking Geraldine Finn's life. When the news broke, Reporters began pointing to possible connections between Janet and Geraldine's cases. Both young women were a similar age. They worked in the medical industry, and they were each last seen after a night out with friends in Waterville. Each of them were last seen in the parking lots of two bars, which were just three miles from each other. The locations where their bodies were found also shared some similarities. Even though Janet was found in the water, the surrounding area was rural and remote. The same had been the case with the location of Geraldine's body. But there was something even more concerning. Goodell had admitted to a family member that he saw Janet Brachu in the parking lot of T. Woody's on the night she was last seen. That directly tied him to the case considering Goodell had not ever come forward to the authorities with this information, despite their frequent appeals. On September 3rd, Goodell appeared in court for his bail hearing. The state put forward their case that he was a danger to society and should remain in custody until his trial the following year. To prove their point, the state brought several witnesses to the stand. They revealed that Goodell had been questioned in relation to Janet's case in the weeks following her disappearance. They successfully proved their case, and Goodell was taken back to jail awaiting his May 1989 trial. When it rolled around, the prosecution was confident they would get a conviction. They had witness evidence stating Goodell was the last person seen with Geraldine, and highlighted his concerning behavior earlier that evening. However, they did not even need to prove he was responsible. Goodell admitted to the crime, but he did so while asking for a lesser sentence. 
he stated that what he did had not been premeditated. Goodell claimed he had taken Geraldine's life in a panic after she ran to get away from him. The prosecution, though, were not interested in giving him a lesser sentence. They felt he was a serious danger and needed to be put behind bars for as long as possible. After a judge found him guilty of the charges, Goodell still had one card up his sleeve to try and reduce the amount of time he would have to spend behind bars. He told investigators that he knew something about Janet Brachu's case, the most important fact of all. He claimed he knew who the perpetrator was. But Goodell was not exactly cooperative. Strangely enough, even after this, Goodell was still never publicly named as a suspect in the case. At his sentencing, Goodell was given 75 years behind bars, with the earliest possible release being in 2033. And then the years began to pass. Soon, Janet's family were welcoming the new millennium with still no news of her case. Three decades had passed before there was an update. In 2019, on the 32nd anniversary of Janet's disappearance, it was announced that a cold case team would begin looking into Janet's demise again. Her mother and father were no longer alive to hear this positive news, but other family members and old friends now had a renewed hope that whoever took Janet's life would be brought to justice, even after all those years. And then, on May 14, 2021, the day everyone had been waiting for, an arrest had been made of a prisoner at Maine State Penitentiary. It was none other than Gerald Goodell. But what had led to this update in a case that had seen no movement for so long? As some of you may have guessed already, it was DNA. State Police Chief John Cote commented on the news, saying, This case represents years of combined work by state, local, and county investigators, prosecutors, and skilled scientists who never relented in their pursuit of the truth and for justice for this victim, her family, and friends. In March 2023, Goodell, now in his early 60s, was given an additional 32.5 years to his sentence for what he did to Janet Brachu. Seeing the writing on the wall, Goodell did not try to deny his involvement and instead pleaded guilty to the charges laid against him. Though her parents could not be in the courtroom that day, other family members gathered to finally get justice for the life taken so young. Her cousin, Daniel Brachu, said, She was a sweet girl, young, foolish, like the rest of us. It may come as a small consolation to Janet's family that the perpetrator responsible had not been out living his life all those years. He had been serving time, even though it was not for her case. As for exactly what happened that night, the details have not been publicly released. Undoubtedly, there will be some secrets Gerald Goodell will take with him to the grave. The last time Mary McLaughlin's daughter saw her alive, she was strolling down the street to her apartment after a fun evening of dominoes. Nothing seemed amiss. She had not a thought in her mind that she would not see her mother again soon. However, that is not what happened. For three and a half decades, the case of Mary McLaughlin's slaying went unsolved, until the police finally had a name. But even then, there was a problem. How could the perpetrator be the person they were looking for when he was serving a prison sentence at the time? On September 26, 1984, 58-year-old Mary McLaughlin was spending the evening at her local pub in Glasgow, Scotland. She was playing dominoes with one of her daughters. Mary had a large extended family and was deeply loved by them all. She was a mother to 11 children and grandmother to 26 grandchildren. Once they had wrapped their evening up, 
Mary's daughter Catherine walked off to the bus stop and rode home. While walking back to her own apartment, Mary made a brief stop at the corner shop. She picked up a pack of cigarettes before continuing on her way. We know she made it home that night, but unbeknownst to her, she was not alone. Six days later, Mary's son Martin arrived for his weekly visit to find the door was locked. He knocked a few times, but his mother was not answering. Concern mounting, Martin tried to get a spare key from her homeowner. When he discovered this was not possible, Martin felt his only choice was to break down the door. As it swung open, he was greeted by a foul odor. Mary was lying in her bed, but it was clear she had passed days ago. Her dressing gown was on backwards, and her dentures were lying on the floor beside her. The cause was clear. The rope from her dressing gown had been wrapped tightly around her neck and was double-knotted. Further examination determined that Mary's life was taken on the evening she returned home from the pub. Martin, seeing his mother in that way, is something he will never forget. Commenting on it, Martin said, It frightened the life out of me and has tortured me ever since. A forensic examination revealed that the perpetrator had left DNA behind. However, back then, the technology had not advanced enough to test such a minute sample. Luckily, the samples were kept safe until the time came, and a long time it was. Other than the confirmed sighting of Mary when she was purchasing her cigarettes, there was another person who came forward to tell the authorities what they had seen. Mary was spotted walking down the street past the shop, barefoot, holding her shoes in her hand. It was likely to ease her aching feet from a day of wearing heeled shoes. The police were desperate for someone to come forward with information that could help them solve the case. They took in hundreds of statements and followed up on all available leads, but yet they got nowhere. The man who last saw her caring for her shoes made some mention of a man following her. When later asked about it at trial, he said, Well, yes, every time Mary walked away, he was always behind her. The authorities believed there was a predator out roaming Glasgow who could strike again at any moment. All they could do at the time was ensure the evidence collected that day was stored safely away until the time came when it could possibly solve this case. It was not until 2008, 24 years later, that those DNA samples were tested again. Unfortunately, the forensic examiners were still unable to get an adequate profile of the perpetrator. Once again, the evidence was tucked away. Then, in 2014, a new DNA profiling facility was opened at the Scottish Crime Campus. This meant that instead of the previous 11 identification markers obtainable from a DNA sample, the scientists utilizing this new technology could identify 24 markers. But what did this really mean? Now, samples that were previously too small to get any real conclusive testing done on could be profiled with a far greater accuracy. In 2019, the evidence from the Mary McLaughlin case was sent to the laboratory in the hopes that this new round of testing would reveal the perpetrator's identity. In particular, they focused in on her dressing gown cord, the item that had been used to take her life. Unraveling the cord and cautiously undoing one of the knots that remained, they swabbed that untouched surface. For 35 years, that part of the fabric had been left undisturbed. This offered the scientists the best chance at obtaining a strong profile. Step one was a success. The team was able to gather a strong DNA profile to run against the Scottish database. When they did so, the match came back rapidly. They knew who was responsible for taking Mary McLaughlin's life that night. 59-year-old Graham McGill, 
a man who was no stranger to the authorities. Now that they had a name, investigators could start looking into McGill. Before long, they uncovered a curious piece of information. McGill was imprisoned at the time of the incident. But how could that be? It turned out that while he was technically serving a prison sentence at that time on September 26, the night Mary was targeted, he was out on temporary release. Temporary releases are allowed for a few reasons, mainly for approved prisoners to get affairs in order for their release, like job interviews or finding housing. Family matters can also apply. That night, McGill was out on an unsupervised release when he spotted Mary walking home, and we know what happened next. McGill had not been a suspect or person of interest in the 1984 investigation. His name had not even come up once. Once the investigators had gotten back the confirmed DNA results, they spent a few months going over the old casework. They had to make sure they had enough evidence, in addition to the DNA results, to put McGill behind bars for what he did to Mary. Then, on December 4, 2019, Graham McGill was arrested and charged in connection with the slaying of Mary McLaughlin. When McGill was taken to trial, one of the witnesses called to the stand was his ex-wife. She told the jury that in 1988, McGill had confessed to taking a woman's life. He told her details of the crime that fit the details of Mary's case. But he threatened that if she told anyone or tried to go to the police, he would take her life as well. When she asked him why he had done it, McGill told his then-wife that he wanted to know what it would feel like. In April 2021, McGill was found guilty and subsequently sentenced to a minimum of 14 years behind bars. He will be in his mid-70s by the time he is even considered for release. Reacting to the jury's verdict, Martin, the son that found Mary's body, commented, There is no joy at the verdict, but there is justice, and my mom can finally rest in peace. It has been years of torture for everyone in the family, and there is a sense of relief. He is a revolting individual, and it brings some comfort to think that he will never again see anywhere other than the inside of a prison. He also revealed the moment he found out about the McGill arrest. Two police officers came to my door on December 4, 2019, and said they had arrested someone and he was due in court the next day. That was it. To receive that news after 35 years was an incredible moment. I had always hoped it would happen, but doubted it actually would. I was totally shocked and just broke down. Over three decades later, Mary McLaughlin finally got justice. Her family can now sleep a little bit easier at night, knowing the monster that took her life is locked behind bars where he belongs.